quick introduction to our speaker this evening, who is uh, Simon Addis. And uh, uh, Oscar Wilde said that we're all born in the gutter and some of us are looking at the stars. Simon is definitely one of uh, life star gazers. Uh, he and I uh, first met uh, the first year at university some 36 years ago. And uh, it, just to give you a sense of how far light would have traveled to have seen that meeting from deep space, you would have to be on the uh, in the system around De Nebola, which is the brightest star in the constellation Leo, or you could have gone backwards and forwards to Alpha Centauri nine times in the time since Simon and I have known each other. Um, so Simon, that's all I really want to say. I think I'm going to uh, risk of stealing your thunder, so I'll be passing over to Simon, uh, who's going to give us a talk on urban astronomy. Um, first of all, thank you very much for allowing me to present my, my passion and my hobby. Um, Dave uh, asked me if I would like to present this. I've been going on about it down the pub to him for some, some years, and it's now my opportunity to sort of formally try to structure a presentation that shows my journey through astrophotography. Um, I didn't have a background in astronomy at all. Um, I just had an interest in gadgets and technology, really. Um, I, was, uh, I have a degree in computer systems engineering. I was at the uh, University of Kent in Canterbury with Dave, as you said, back in 1987 we met. Um, and I've been in an IT industry. I work for a company called Element um, in West London. Uh, they're an uh, encryption and uh, secure communications company. And I've been in IT for uh, uh, not longer than I care to remember, several, several decades, <clears throat> shall we say. So in this presentation today, uh, it's an unusual title, I'm Glimpses of Deep Space from a Rooftop in Chiswick. Um, it seems like an unlikely place to do deep sky astrophotography. And I thought that this wasn't possible, but hopefully as we go through today's slides, you'll see um, how that was indeed possible and how you can take some amazing pictures of space, even from your own back garden. Um, so just going through a quick agenda, I'd like to start with uh, a gallery of images to sort of show you what's possible. Because um, as I show these images to people, I see their eyes widen and they can't believe that this was taken uh, from your own back garden. Now, some of these pictures, in my opinion, you know, come, uh, are often compared to those that are, are taken by NASA. And you'll see how they compare yourself. You can make the judgment as to whether you think this is um, a, a rightful comparison. Um, I'll talk about how I got started in astrophotography. Um, as I said, I didn't come from astronomy or photography. I just came from an interest in uh, gadgets and technology, and I'll show you how that evolved. I'll talk about what kit you need. Obviously, you need telescopes, cameras and things, and we can talk about how that works. Um, talk a little bit about how you capture and process the images, special techniques we use, including long exposure photography, uh, to pull out the faint detail that is out there if you look carefully enough. And um, I'll talk about my setup today. I'm quite proud of, a, of an observatory I built. It's on the roof as we speak, right above my head. Uh, so if you hear some whirring noises, that's probably the telescope in action. Um, and then have, some, have a look at some references towards the end. So that's how I wanted to structure the presentation. So just by way of setting the scene, I live in Chiswick in West London. When I started this hobby in 2013, I was living in Henley-on-Thames in Oxfordshire, um, both of which have pretty poor skies. This is a picture I took out of the window recently with my iPhone of the night sky in Chiswick. Uh, and what, you're, what you can see is quite a bright sky glow. In fact, we're looking straight here at the Brentford Football Club football stadium. And this is where they're treating the grass overnight to make it grow better by having very strong lights. This light pollution is pushing up into the atmosphere and it's bouncing off the clouds. And this is causing havoc with my astrophotography. Um, but despite that, so this is the kind of skies I'm working in. Um, but let's just look at what, I mean, this is me blowing my own trumpet a little bit, just to give you some idea for the things that I feel I'm quite proud of. Um, I was nominated for Astronomy Photography of the Year in the Nebula category in 2015. So this is just two years after starting the hobby um, from light polluted skies. And I had a picture published by NASA on their astronomy photograph of the day. It's called an A-Pod. So it's still, still there now. If you want to go and search for my name and NASA, you'll find my photograph up here. Um, and uh, I can show you this and many more photographs of this type. So you get an idea of the sort of quality that you can get from, uh, uh, from equipment in your own back garden. 
I also had images published in magazines. This is Astronomy Now magazine. Uh, one of my photographs, quite pleased with that. So <clears throat> this is despite not really promoting it too much. These things get picked up. The BBC wrote to me to ask me if I wanted one of my pictures to be on their TV program. Unfortunately, they didn't use it. And it was in Australia on a live TV program, which I watched through the night. But um, <clears throat> it's nice to be asked that they pick up these pictures and think they're worthy of publishing. So that said, <clears throat> let's take a quick look at uh, the gallery. Uh, in Take Heart style, for those of you who remember that program. Um, this is, I'm doing this in order of image from uh, closest to the Earth through to furthest away. So to start with, we have a comet. A comet is a solar system object. This was uh, taken with uh, relatively short exposures. It's a relatively bright comet, Comet Lovejoy. This was taken in 2015. Um, and it's a very tricky object to take a picture of because the comet is, it looks like it's moving from bottom left to top right in this picture. But you'll be mistaken because this is actually traveling in a different direction. The, the tail is pointing away from the sun. And so it's traveling at quite a speed. Uh, in fact, every time you take a photograph, it's moved across the screen slightly. Uh, and you have to take that into account when you're processing your images because everything becomes blurred. Um, so that's one example of um, a near. Earth object, which I thought was quite uh, quite striking in its, uh, in its aesthetics. <clears throat> and moving forward, we have another picture here. This is the, uh, the, the Horsehead Nebula. This is a nebula that is in the belt of Orion. If ever you've looked up and seen uh, the constellation of Orion, you'll notice three stars in a row which comprise the belt of Orion. And the, star, the bright star you see in this image is the left-hand star of the belt. Um, and um, you can see there's a characteristic horse head shape in the object there. That's, that's actually uh, obscuring gas and dust. So it's actually an object in itself. It happens to look like a horse head and so the name's stuck. This is about 1,500 light years away. And this is a three and a half hour narrow band long exposure photograph. Uh, moving forward, we have the Rosette Nebula. The Rosette Nebula is just north of, of Orion in the night sky. Um, quite a large object, relatively speaking, very faint. But this was um, a four hour long exposure taken with two filters. It's 5,200 light years away and it's about 30 light years across. And this is the actual photograph that I was nominated for uh, the, in the nebula category for the Astronomy Photographer of the Year at the Royal Observatory in Greenwich. Um, next along, we have further out, we're now looking at other galaxies. This is the Andromeda galaxy. This is the only galaxy that's visible with the naked eye. It's two and a half million light years away. Um, and uh, interesting facts about this are that it's actually quite big in the sky. If it was to be compared to the moon, it would take up six full moons in the sky. So it's actually a bright object. It's just very, it's very faint, but it's, it's quite big. You can see it with the naked eye. Um, it's two and a half million light years away, which means the light was sent away from this object two and a half million years ago, and it arrived at my telescope just recently. And it's interesting to, to note that mankind wasn't even roaming the planet when the light left this galaxy to arrive at my telescope two and a half million light years later. Um, it's 1, 000, sorry, 110,000 light years in radius. It has one trillion stars. It looks like a cloud of gas and dust, but it's actually millions and trillions of stars together in a, in a blob. It has two companion galaxies going around it. You can see the, the faint blobs around the edge. And it's on a collision course with our own galaxy. Um, and it will actually collide with the Milky Way, but don't worry because it's about 5 billion years in the future that this will happen. Uh, which is not that long in, in astronomical terms. So that's the Andromeda galaxy. That's, a, that's a, a, red, a, a red, green, blue filter photograph taken with long exposures. Uh, and next up, and this is the last of the compilation that I just wanted to show you to start with, is the Whirlpool galaxy. This was a very interesting object. This is two spiral galaxies colliding. So you're witnessing the, the dance that two galaxies make as they come together. In fact, they've already passed each other once and they're just going through to the second time now, uh, but we can't see it moving, obviously. This is taking billions of years to move to these, to these uh, structures. Um, 
This is five hours of exposure, very faint galaxy, very small in the, in the eyepiece as well. And it's 23 million light years away, uh, which again is in our back garden when it comes to astronomy. Uh, we can take pictures of up to 13 billion light years away if you use the James Webb Space Telescope, but uh, that's a bit out of my budget. So uh, we're having to do with these kind of photographs for now. So that's some examples of um, some of the pictures I've taken. So where did I, how did I start this, this hobby? This is the first telescope that I bought back in 2013. I was just bored one day, decided to go on Amazon, always wanted to look through a telescope. So I bought this one, did some research. This is the Celestron Nexstar 8 SE. It's eight because it's eight inches in diameter. Uh, it's got a mirror at one end uh, and a corrector plate at the other. So it doesn't use lenses. It's not, it's not using glass in that sense. It's using mirrors. Um, it actually bounces like backwards and forwards. So it's effectively one meter long if you were to unfold the light as it's bent in the telescope. Um, it has a hand controller, which allows you to type in the object that you're looking for, and it will, in theory, move the telescope to point directly at that object. Uh, it's very high magnification, and it's great for looking at planets and things like that, very small objects. So what did I get with this? <clears throat> Let's have a look and see what I got, first of all. So this is my first ever astronomy photograph. This was taken with an iPhone 6. Uh, I just stuck it over the lens of the telescope. It was wobbling around a bit and, and moving with the, uh, with the interference from the uh, atmosphere. But quite, a, quite an amazing photograph. And you can see some really interesting detail here. I mean, you've got the, the Apennine Mountains on the moon. This is a 600 kilometer long uh, mountain range. Uh, the highest mountain is about 6.1 kilometers high. Um, you can see um, Tycho, one of the largest craters on the surface of the moon. It's uh, 85 kilometers across. Um, and you see the radial spurs coming out, but this is a big impact that happened many billions of years ago and it's spread out across the surface. And interestingly, you can also see, well, not specifically, but you can see the landing site of the Apollo 11 uh, first landing on the moon, which is where the small circle is in, in the dark circle in the center there. This is in the Sea of Tranquility. Obviously my telescope's not big enough to be able to zoom in to see the uh, landing equipment, but that's exactly where they landed. So it's fascinating. And to see this with your own eyes is quite breathtaking, first of all. It really does get you hooked on the hobby. So where did I go from there? I started pointing my telescope at other points in the night sky. And here again is a video taken with my iPhone through the lens. This is Jupiter. And you can start to see some surface detail. If you look carefully, you can see some stripes. These are the weather patterns across the surface of Jupiter. And the other dots you can see there are the Galilean moons. So you can see Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. These are the four largest moons or brightest moons of Jupiter. Um, and it's interesting because uh, Jupiter is so big that it looks, um, you know, you can see it in this picture, but one of those moons is bigger than Mercury just the moon itself. So it puts it into context of how big that planet is. Um, so this is what you can do with a video. So I decided maybe if I added some extra kit to my arsenal, I might be able to sit in the comfort of my kitchen whilst taking pictures from the outside in the garden where it's nice and cold outside. So I added some kit. The first thing I added was a, an SLR camera. Now this is just the body of the camera, you don't need the lens. The lens is the telescope itself. And it fits onto the back of the telescope using an adapter. You can see that in the picture. Um, I also bought a power pack. You can see the uh, car battery in a box. They, if, if everything is um, badged up to look like a piece of astronomy equipment, they charge 10 times more. In fact, it's just the car battery, <laughs> uh, which you could have picked up a lot cheaper. But anyway, it allows me to power the telescope. And then I connected some wires and I connected a laptop and the laptop uh, plugs into the telescope in under the hand controller. So now I can sit in the comfort of my living room uh, or, or, or uh, kitchen and uh, the telescope's outside whirring away in the back garden. Um, so what could I take with this setup? Um, and here's some examples. Again, we're talking about bright objects in the sky. These aren't faint objects. These are objects taking with just a few seconds of exposure. 
Um, on the le bottom left, you can see the moon, obviously, with the craters, and top left, you see are some other images of Jupiter. Interestingly, if you look carefully on the top left, you can see a dot on the surface of Jupiter. And that is not a moon, that's the reflection of a moon on the surface of the planet. It just happens to be caught as it's going past. Um, the other picture of Jupiter shows the great red spot, which I was quite pleased to be able to see that through uh, my telescope. Um, and you can see other things like Saturn. When you first see Saturn through a telescope, it's quite awe-inspiring. You can't believe this object can exist in nature. It is the most bizarre looking thing uh, when you see it with your own eyes. And there's globular clusters. These are clusters of stars that look like a small ball. Um, and those are very bright and you can take pictures of those as well. So, so far so good. I'm taking pictures of bright objects um, and it's absolutely amazing. You, each time you take a picture, you get more and more hooked and you want to get the next picture. So the next question is, how do I take pictures of fainter objects? Objects that you can't really see with the naked eye. They pose some serious problems because you can't see them. So you need longer exposures to take a picture of them. And what do I mean by longer exposure? I mean, you are holding the shutter open on the camera for up to 10 minutes at a time. And you imagine you have to keep the camera very still, you have to track with the night sky, uh, and otherwise everything will be ruined. Um, and so how do you track that long? How do you actually get the telescope to track? Um, so what I needed was a new mount and a new telescope. Already, this is just uh, my, my <laughs> it can become a very expensive hobby, this astrophotography. So I looked at my current uh, tripod. This is what they call an alt-as tripod. It's an altitude azimuth tripod. It moves right, left, up and down. It doesn't, it's not designed to track with the rotation of the earth. For long exposure photography, you need what we call an equatorial mount. And this is positioned so that the head is tilted slightly. It's a motorized mount, but at this time it, it tracks precisely with the line of the equator on, this, on the sky. So as you leave the shutter open for 10 minutes or even 30 minutes at a time, it will track with the night sky and keep the star focused in the center of the eyepiece. So that was uh, my first <clears throat> expense. And then also needed a new telescope. Um, I looked around and I, I found out that refractors are better than reflectors for taking pictures of very faint objects like nebula. Um, and they, that's because they use lenses rather than mirrors. The problem with lenses are that they're very expensive. The larger the lens, the more expensive they become. So you won't ever find a wide, fat, refractor telescope because they just cost so much money. So the faster I could, the, 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 the most expensive one that I could, uh, uh, well, the cheapest one I could find that did the job is the Takahashi FSQ 106 ED. Now this is like, if this was a car, it would be a Ferrari. I, I took it out once at a star party and people were in awe at me at getting this thing out. They were surrounding me because they thought, what is this? It's like a, you know, like a Rolex or something. Anyway, it's quite expensive. It was about, it was about 4,000 pounds. So again, there are many telescopes before this one. This is just that I wanted to go for the best I could whilst I could. Um, the other thing you need for long exposure photography is what we call guiding. Guiding means that you have to buy another telescope and stick it on the side of the original telescope. Uh, and the reason for that is because it, it's used specifically to track a star in the sky. And you see the software on the right here is called PHD2, uh, it's short for push here dummy. Don't ask me why they called it that, but um, it's very simple. It just tracks on a star and it moves the mount as the sky moves. So you precisely track on the star over, I'm doing exposures now for up to 30 minutes at a time. So we put all that together <clears throat> and this is my telescope, phase two. This is my SLR connected to the back of the telescope. You can see the SLR camera. You can see the guide scope on the side of the telescope. You can see the counterweight. There's a very heavy weight there that balances the, the weight of the telescope on the mount. And you can see the hand controller there as well. So it becomes a real mess of wires very quickly. Uh, and especially when you're out in the dark, it's very difficult to see what you're doing and you get everything tangled up and it's very frustrating. But I persisted and I started to take some pictures. So what, what kind of pictures could I take at this point? Again, this is the Horsehead Nebula taken with a SLR camera. Not that long in exposure, but nevertheless, you're starting to see detail. I was quite proud of it at the time. 
Uh, it was my next step in astrophotography. Um, but it's a bit red, it's a bit poor quality, it's a bit grainy. There was a lot I still had to learn. So what can we do to further improve the picture? Well, we move to what we call techniques like calibration. When you take an astronomy photograph, you need to take special pictures with the camera to remove the noise and artifacts from the photographs. The first one we take is what we call a dark, a dark frame. A dark frame is you take it with the lens cap on, interestingly. You put the lens cap on, and you take a series of photographs, and it records what we call the shot noise of the camera. And it just gives you what looks like a black photograph, but essentially it contains information about the noise of that of that um, telescope, of that camera's sensor. And that can be reversed out of the picture. And the second one we take is what we call flats. And these are more dramatic. They're taken during dusk or dawn. Um, or you can and you use an old t-shirt and you put it over the, the, the opening of the telescope and you take a picture of the sky during the day. And it gives you what you can see here, which is like a, a vignetted image of uh, a, 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 a flat screen. So it effectively you can, you can add this to your image and it flattens out the picture and all the vignetting you get from the telescope uh, uh, itself gets reversed and you get a very flat photograph of here. This is great. It gets rid of all the dust on the lens and everything. And you can see here, you've got, uh, you can use an electroluminescent panel to do the same thing. And that's what I use now. So it's much more convenient. So once those darks and flats have been added, the next thing you can do is what we call stacking. Uh, so this is how we improve the quality of an image. We take the same photograph time and time and time again. Each time we take it, we stack it together with the previous one and it averages out the noise and it improves the signal. So it improves what we call the signal to noise ratio of the photograph and everything becomes smoother and clearer. So you now have to take like maybe 10 photographs of the same object, stack them together and you get a much clearer picture as a result. Um, it's not, you can't keep stacking forever and get an imperfect photograph. There is a line of diminishing return. So the first two stacks will be, give you 80% and the next 20 will give you 20%. But when you're on the quest for quality, you're happy to take as many as it takes to get the best quality you can get. There's two uh, software packages, Deep Sky Stacker and CCD Stack that are very popular for the stacking process. But let's see what we get now. So based on these new techniques, this is the kind of image that I was able to take. This is the Orion Nebula. Um, starting to look, look better, a lot clearer. Um, uh, using these processing techniques, getting better with my processing software, I'm able to start to, start to see some really striking features on the, in, in the object itself. It looks like it's almost, um, you, know, you can see the mist itself. This is clouds of gas and dust where stars are being born. And this is an object in our galaxy, in, in, in one of the spiral arms of our galaxy. It's about 4,000, I think, light years away. Um, quite, so it's quite striking detail. And here's some other examples of pictures I took Again, they're very red. Um, and at the time I was really happy with them, but they're red because with the eye, if you, see, if you looked at these objects, you'd see these as they are here, because they're red. They, they're mostly hydrogen and helium in composition. And those uh, chemicals emit light in the red spectrum. Um, so unfortunately with the human eye, that's what we would see. Um, how, how can we improve that even further? So the way to do that is to buy some more kit. And I started to invest in a, a new camera and some filters to help me try and improve the picture quality. Um, you can see the camera on the end of the telescope is the, the blue thing at the end there. This is what we call a CCD camera. Uh, the latest technology is called CMOS, but the CCD camera is the one you can see here. Now, again, they're not cheap. It's about 3000 pounds for this camera. It's specifically for astronomy, and it uses a 8.3 megapixel full frame sensor. And the interesting thing about this is that it cools that sensor down to about minus 40, minus 50 degrees centigrade. So the cooler the chip is, the clearer the photograph that you can take um, because of all the noise that builds up with the heat. So the idea is to keep it cool. And also it introduces a, what we call a filter wheel. You can see the, the five circles here. This is where we put our filters. These are 
little discs of glass that we use to filter out the light into specific wavelengths, usually red, green, and blue. This camera, interestingly, is black and white. It doesn't take color pictures, but it produces a color result at the end. And I'll show you how we do that in just a second. Um, I also invested in some new software. This is Sequence Generator Pro. This is one of the popular sequencing packages. This allows me to create uh, a storyboard of which pictures I want to take throughout the night. It tells me where the object is. I can tell it which filter I want, how long the exposure is. It auto focuses my camera. It points the telescope in the right direction. It plate solves to make sure I'm looking in the right direction. Does all these things automatically whilst hopefully I'm asleep in bed at night. And I also invested in Photoshop. This is for the post-processing. Um, there are other packages. PixInsight is the, is the big one that astronomers tend to use, but if you want a more general image processing package, Photoshop is one of the best. Uh, it's, a, it's a steep learning curve, and you use what we call layers uh, to improve the quality of the picture and blend the color together. So everything's going well, and then I move to London from Henley. So suddenly my skies got much, much, much worse. This is a light pollution map showing you the area around London. And you'll notice it's mainly yellow. It gets pretty bad. The, the, the lighter it gets, I think the worse. You see in London here, we get some pretty poor skies for light pollution. And if you notice, um, one of the characteristics of that point on the map there is that it's got a, what we call a bortle of eight or nine, class eight or nine. And that's how we measure light pollution. So light pollution in London is in that level. And the reason why that's uh, interesting is because we have this scale. Uh, it's called the Bortle scale, and it measures your light pollution in your area. If you're lucky enough to live in a, in a Bortle 1 sky, and those are probably off the coast of Madagascar only, you get skies that show the whole Milky Way with visible with the naked eye. Absolutely incredible. All the way through to London on the right, it's Bortle 9. So I moved from Henley, which is Bortle 5, which is pretty poor. You can see the number of stars you can see in the sky is pretty low, all the way through to London, which is now a bottle eight, nine. So I thought the hobby was over. How am I possibly gonna take pictures through that light, light pollution? So I read a bit more about it and I, then I discovered what we call narrow band filters. Narrow band filters uh, cut through the light pollution by just allowing the emission from certain chemicals to come through. So hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur are the main ones. And it just so happens that these are the emission lines of nebula in the galaxy, the common elements that make up those, those objects. They emit light on those frequencies. So if you just select those frequencies and you leave everything else out, you can cut out the sodium from light pollution from street lamps, you can cut out the light pollution from light reflected off the moon and from the, from the Brentford Football Club uh, grass growing society. Um, and therefore, you get a much, much clearer picture. So you may be familiar with the, this photograph here. Now, I didn't take this one. This is uh, taken by NASA. This is the Pillars of Creation, made very famous by the Hubble Space Telescope. And you might notice it's got a characteristic kind of reddish blue color. This isn't natural light. This is a false color image. And the reason it's false color is because it's used these narrow band filters, sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen, and combine those colors together to provide a, a, what we call a false color image. But it provides information. The blue shows where the oxygen is, the green is where the hydrogen is, and the red is where the sulfur is. So it gives information about the object you're looking at, even if it's false color. So how do we do that in practice? Let's have a look. I remember, I've got a black and white camera. I've invested all this money in a black and white camera. How am I going to get a color photograph? So what we do is we take a picture in each filter, a stacked picture in each filter. So we've got hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. This is the same object taken through those three different filters. So we're looking at the same area of the sky, and they're very, very different the result you get. Um, and fascinatingly, um, you can see where the hydrogen is, where the oxygen is, and where the sulfur is in the object itself. Um, so if I put those together in a, what we call colorizing them, so we cut the stars out, first of all, as a technique to remove the stars. 
and then we colorize them into blue, green, and red, the primary colors. And what we do then is we blend them together to produce a color image uh, by just adding them together. They add together and they produce this, this sort of color uh, image for the result. So this is the kind of object and subject we can take a picture of now. Uh, again, this is false color. It's the same technique that NASA uses with the Hubble Space Telescope and with the James Webb Telescope now to produce these fairly stunning images of, of the night sky. Um, so where am I today? This is um, uh, where we've got to. So I've, I've now got, I've got a, a Flickr website. If you're interested to see more photographs that I've taken, if you type my name, Simon Addis, and then Flickr, you'll, see, you'll get straight to my web page here, which is where all my images are. So if you're interested, we've got pictures of galaxies, nebula, uh, and near-Earth objects, um, which you can uh, have a look at at your own leisure. Um, so where am I today with this? I take, decided to, I didn't want to sit outside in the rain, it, sorry, in the rain, I didn't want to sit outside in the cold. So I, I decided to build a, an observatory. It is a permanently fixed structure on the roof of the house, and it uses uh, planters. These are uh, garden planters stacked one on top of the other into a box shape. And the telescope and tripod sit within inside that box, and it uses a car aerial, telescopic car aerial, electric one, to close and open the roof. And that all happens automatically when the sky is clear. Uh, or when the rain comes, it senses the rain, senses the night sky clarity, and it opens the telescope at three o'clock in the morning and takes pictures even when I'm asleep. That was my goal. So I also built a mobile application using an IoT package called Blink, which allows me to fully see the cloud cover. I can control things if things go wrong. Um, it's all about convenience for me. I just wanted to be able to get the pictures in a the, in the convenient way as possible. So that's where I am today. Um, and I did. I can do a whole presentation on that particular, how I built that, if anyone's interested uh, at a future date. Um, so just to sort of close off here a bit now, we, I just wanted to point out that you don't have to have a telescope to take pictures of the night sky. You could just use a normal SLR camera lens. These are what we call wide field images. Um, the two examples here on the left, you can see the, um, the Northern Lights. This is when I went to Iceland an absolutely freezing evening, lucky to see them at all, but managed to hold my finger on the shutter for long enough without it freezing off to take a picture of the Northern Lights, uh, a slightly long exposure, a few seconds. On the right hand side, you can see our own Milky Way galaxy. This is off the beach in Madagascar. And I took this, I managed to put into my, my travel suitcase, uh, and the object that you can see is a white box. It's called a Polari and it fits onto a camera tripod and your camera sits on top of that and it allows you to take long exposures uh, tracking with the night sky. So these pictures here were taken, um, I mean, you can see the Milky Way with your own eyes, but when you take a long exposure photograph, I was just staggered the amount of detail that comes out and you can see the palm trees swaying in the wind there in the, in the background. So this is my first uh, experience of using sort of wide field astrophotography. I might pursue that again, moving forward. Um, so just to finish off, some interesting programs and books that I found very useful in the hobby. Uh, the, one of the best ones is Making Every Photon Count by Steve Richards. This is a very popular book with amateur astrophotographers. It helps you to go through the whole process I just described. And if you get really into it, there's the Astrophotography Manual um, which, by Chris Woodhouse, which is way more advanced but really goes into detail about automation and other aspects of um, narrowband astrophotography. Um, there was one other software program I wanted to just show you quickly. That's the end of my presentation as it is but um, you're welcome to uh, look up my Flickr page if you want to do it, see more photographs and there's my email address and um, just before we end yeah, so this is a program called Stellarium, a uh, really cool program for allowing you to sort of navigate the night sky. And this is just a web app, so you don't even have to install anything. You just go to stellarium-web.org and you can see the night sky in its entirety. It tracks with the movement of the sky in real time. 
and you can search for objects. You can even see um, things like uh, satellites moving through space. And if you get close enough, you can start to see, there's the Andromeda galaxy that I was referring to and took a photograph of earlier. Uh, so a really nice way to uh, see what's going on in the night sky. And um, I also had another app which was going to show you for mobile phone, which is called, um, uh, what is it called? I forgot what it's called now. It's called, um, I'll remember the name in a second. This is um, allowing, this is another package I use to, to plan my night's astronomy. It shows me all the objects in the sky at the time, and it shows me a timeline. Where it's green, it's visible, in the, so it's dark, and it's actually above the horizon. So if I go to, for example, uh, one of these objects, the Crab Nebula, I can see more information about it, and I can see when it rises, when it falls, I can see the best month to take a picture of it, because you have to plan all these things. Um, I can see what it looks like through the telescope. I can see how it sets and falls. And I can even put the, the uh, horizon around my, my roof. So I can see when it goes behind the neighbor's roof. Uh, and you can plan accordingly your night time astrophotography. So those are just a couple of examples of the software packages that are out there. Um, there are many others. Hopefully you've, you've given you a kind of overview and we've kept it at a very high level. It's a very complex subject and a very steep learning curve in places. Uh, but hopefully, if you decided to start the uh, hobby, uh, it gives you some guidelines uh, moving forward. Thank you, Dave. But I just wanted if you would mind recounting your experience at uh, customs in Madagascar, because yeah. uh, <laughs> I thought that was yeah. funny. <clears throat> yeah, that small white box, um, which I discussed earlier. Let's see if I can just bring it up again. This box in the corner here, little square box. It's a few inches long. Um, it's quite heavy. I carried this through with my hand luggage uh, through customs at uh, Madagascar, and, they have, and no one knows what it is. Um, it's got batteries in it. It looks very suspicious. They thought it was a bomb. So I was uh, interrogated for some time, and I was trying to explain to them it's to take pictures of the sky, but they didn't believe me. So one of the pitfalls of taking this kind of kit away is being able to describe what it's for. Um, and the first question is, is there an image that you, you most want to capture? It's on your sort of list of uh, your bucket list of uh, images you want to get. Uh, it's a good question. Um, for a long time, I wanted to capture the pillars of creation because it was made famous by the Hubble Space Telescope and NASA. And it's made famous again now by the James Webb Space Telescope in infrared. So stunning images of these, uh, these, these um, pillars in, in space. Um, I was lucky enough to get a photo of that, but it's pretty poor and doesn't really rival with that, the one, the one taken with NASA, from NASA. But I'm, it's on my to-do list to take a much better one in narrow band uh, and then put it side by side to compare it to see how I get on. See if I've saved $8 billion of US taxpayers' money to get that picture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, I have a question from, uh, from Gary Bilkers. Um, how much of the sky can you see unobstructed from your roof? Uh, fortunately, it's uh, two floors up and it's a flat roof. And um, I got so when I was in Henley, I had trees in the garden and I had real problems trying to take long exposures because it would just go behind the, the tree itself. Um, luckily, now I have pretty much unobstructed views of the entire sky. That's the plus side. The downside is that one night I woke up and it had disappeared because a gust of wind came along and blew it off the roof. <laughs> uh, luckily, it landed on next door's roof. Uh, and no damage was done, but I managed to put it back. Now I've got guide wires around it to hold it in those strong winds. So um, it's a trade-off. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so uh, next question I've got for you is, what is next on your shopping list uh, of, of your kit and what will it let you do? So they always say the most important thing to focus on, excuse the pun, is the mount. The mount itself is the thing that is, needs to be proper solid and stable when it's tracking. The slightest imperfection in that tracking and it becomes a smudge in your photograph. Uh, luckily, I got away with a relatively cheap mount at 700 pounds. But <laughs> my goal is, and friends of mine who've got these mounts, uh, is to get a Mac 1. And a Mac 1 is like, again, the Ferrari of the mount world. This uses, um, uh, 
it has independent motors for every axis. It's not belt driven and it's about 10,000 quids worth of kit. Oh, wow. But um, <clears throat> they are sought after by the amateur astrophotographers. And, and, you know, it's like fishing with dynamite when you get one of those. You've got no problems with tracking. Everything's so simple to use. So one day, if I save up enough money, I'll have one of those. Okay, great. Right, well, questions are coming in thick and fast now. So um, let's start in order uh, from Paul and Julia. Um, first of all, a brilliant presentation. Thank you. Um, how much does an entry level telescope cost? Uh, for example, the first one you showed, which I think was Celestron 8 inch. Well, that's, yeah, that's good. I mean, Celestron, the, the one I bought was the biggest of the set, I think, pretty much. They come in different sizes. You can get a four inch one. This is the width of the telescope or an eight inch one. I think they go up to about 11 uh, in size, 11 inches across. Obviously, they get cheaper as they get smaller. You don't have to have an eight inch telescope. Um, a four inch would be more than enough. Um, and I think the one I bought was about a thousand pounds and uh, there are much cheaper ones. I would say, I haven't checked recently, but they're sort of in the 600 quid mark probably. Again, it's quite expensive. There are a lot cheaper ones and there's a website called Astro Buy and Sell, which sells secondhand equipment. So when people get bored with their kit, they sell it on and you can pick up absolute bargains on there um, if you're looking for saving some money. Okay, um, so a sort of follow-on question from that from Kimball is um, someone new into the hobby, um, what is the first priority for investment? Uh, is it camera, telescope, uh, the front-end technology like filters, etc.? What, what's, what's the sort of order of assembling your kit? Again, they say the mount is the first priority, if you get that right. If you want to take long exposure photography, as opposed to just looking through the telescope, because there's a whole army of people out there that what they call visual astronomers who just look through the telescope. Uh, for me, that didn't really do it for me because you, if you look through it, you can see bright objects, but you can't see anything faint. <clears throat> and if you can, it's all in black and white. It's nothing like the images I've shown you. Um, so the mount is the most important thing for photography. And I guess the next thing would be the camera, because um, you can get away with an, an SLR lens. You don't have to have a telescope to start with. In fact, I'd, I'd, I'd recommend getting an SLR just to get used to the idea of guiding and long exposure and using a standard uh, SLR lens to take the picture. It means you're going to get wider pictures of the sky. So you won't get uh, faint, uh, smaller objects, but you'll get wide vistas of the sky. And that's great for certain types of objects. So I think the mount and camera uh, would be first. <laughs> And Kim was just uh, put a follow on comment there saying, I remember the first time I saw Saturn through a telescope, it was stunning and it proved it was real. <laughs> you don't believe it. I, I mean, I st I'm still aghast that when I first saw it, the tiny, tiny dot that you start to make out this uh, rings and it just looks so unnatural, you know, in a weird way, you know, because you are looking at something that's just evolved and yet it looks so regular uh, as if someone's put it there. Very, very, very strange. Oh, that's good. Um, Melissa is asking, have you ever captured an unseen image? Um, I assume that means you being the first to have spotted a new object. Um, yes, this one here. So this is the same object side by side. It's a, the, it's a um, M82, one of the uh, galaxies. Um, I took this photograph on the left in December, and on the right, I took another picture of it in January. And you'll notice there's an extra dot in the picture. Now that isn't a star in our galaxy, that's a type 1a supernova exploding in the other galaxy. And they're so rare to, to take a picture where you've taken a picture almost just before the event occurred. So it lasted about a few weeks, but I was one of the very few amateur astronomers to have taken a picture just days before it emerged and became visible. So it was just luck more than anything else. But it's of scientific interest because it shows what the object looked like just before and just after it was, uh, it was present. There's a massive, massive explosion. I mean, you can't, it looks like it's the same size as that star, but the star next to it is in our galaxy. That dot is in another galaxy. I and mean, we can imagine the size of that explosion. It's just phenomenal. Hmm. Amazing. 
Great, that's a good question, Melissa. Um, so we have a another question uh, from G, which is uh, which time of year, I guess, is the best to to do uh, to do this hobby, um, winter or summer? Um, well, uh, in the northern hemisphere, obviously the winter because the nights are longer. Um, it's a frustrating hobby in the summer, not only because the nights are shorter. But also because the, the Milky Way, which is where most of these nebula are, has set below the horizon. And all you see is you're looking into outer space, which is great if you're looking at galaxies. Gal other galaxies are, are plentiful. You can see the Virgo cluster, there's a hundreds of galaxies out there. The problem is they're what we call broadband subjects. You can't take pictures with narrow band filters because they don't emit hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur in those specific emission lines. So you have to use broadband, which means you can't remove the light pollution by using filters. So you can do them from dark sky sites, but not from urban areas like, like London. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, a question from Roger, which is, what impact does a flying object like a plane or a helicopter have when you are taking a, a picture? Um, well, it's getting worse because of the Starlink satellites going up from SpaceX. There are thousands and thousands now of satellites uh, going past your camera lens uh, on a nightly basis. And so whenever you're taking a long exposure, now I'm taking pictures of up to 30 minutes in each exposure, you're bound to get a satellite coming through, if not the tail fin of the flight coming into Heathrow, which is just next door. Um, the good news is with stacking, that image can still be used because you're using the average of several pictures taken. All of the others don't have that uh, aberration in the picture. So it gets averaged out of the picture. When you stack it, the final image doesn't include that satellite trail or those lights from the aircraft. So, but yes, it's a big, it's a big problem and it's getting worse with um, more and more space debris up there uh, mm -hmm. obscuring the view. Okay, great. Um... So another question from Kimball, um, as you mentioned a few planets, but otherwise you seem to have majored on very far things such as nebulae. Um, have you ever, uh, so have you looked at any near earth objects such as asteroids uh, or things that may hit us? Um, I have seen asteroids. They are just like stars, a moving dot. They just happen to move from night to night in the same frame. Uh, it's, it's a whole area of astrophotography you can get into. I haven't personally uh, followed down that route. I uh, have taken pictures of comets. They come along very frequently, maybe once a year or so, you'll see a, a new comet. Sometimes they're bright enough to be seen with the naked eye, but it's quite rare. Uh, but if you know where to look, you can find the comet and take pictures of those. That's always very interesting because they're very different and you, they're so unpredictable. You don't know whether they're going to break apart or whether the tail's going to go bright at any moment, and they last about a month or two. So those are the objects. And also, I've taken pictures of like Neptune. Um, I tried to take a picture of Pluto, but it's pretty difficult because it's a tiny, tiny little dot, but you can do that. So as they get further away, the planets get more and more tricky to, to take you know, any kind of meaningful photograph of. Mm -hmm. um, so Kim was asking about a couple of terms we've used, uh, Starling and SpaceX, which is obviously Starlink and SpaceX. So um, I could attempt to answer that, but I'll throw that one to you, Simon you probably know better than I do. What is the question? Uh, what are Starlink and SpaceX? Ah, okay, sorry. SpaceX is a company run by Elon Musk, which is the next generation of uh, manned space uh, rockets. Um, they also do put satellites into orbit on a regular basis. And just a few days ago, they sent up another 100 uh, Starlink satellites. These are low, uh, low orbit uh, satellites that do that provide internet connectivity for uh, remote areas like Africa and so on, people who don't have any fixed infrastructure. Uh, you just need a satellite dish and you've got high speed broadband, which is a great idea, but for as amateur astrophotographers, these, these small, you know, briefcase size objects are reflecting sunlight. And as they pass by your camera, they leave a big trail across your photograph and it's getting almost impossible now to take a picture without a satellite trail going through. Great, thanks, Simon. Um, another question from Gary Bilkus. Um, before you had your rooftop set up, how long did it take to get the scope set up, properly aligned, calibrated, et cetera? 
or did you keep it in the same place uh, for nights on end? At the beginning, I uh, took took the kit outside, uh, assembled it, and then I had to do basic alignment and then advanced polar alignment to make sure that it's directly lined up with the equator in the sky. Um, and that was a tedious, long process. And you, you get it wrong by a small amount and the whole evening is destroyed. So um, I decided to leave the telescope out in the garden and put a cover over it. And that worked for a while. Um, but having an observatory on the roof means I can precisely polar align it and keep the roof shut so that it's always there. If ever the sky is clear, which it is probably about once or twice a month, um, and you've got the time to do it, you can now just push a button and it will just start up and take advantage of that night sky. So in answer to the question, the reason why I built the observatory was for that very reason. It is such a difficult thing to take your kit out, set it up, polar align it, and then take it all back down again when the rain starts uh, a few minutes later. So I wanted to say thank you on behalf of everyone who's uh, taken part this evening uh, for, for a fantastic uh, presentation. So interesting. Mm -hmm.